I want to talk about a couple things. Um, the first being just some of the ways that gender inequities are kind of interwoven in our society that are less visible but are impacting us a lot. And so we're going to start with astronauts because you should always start with astronauts. Um, so about a year or so ago, they had the first all-female spacewalk, which was awesome um, and also long overdue. And one of the reasons why it took so long had to do with spacesuits. So in like the 90s, NASA discontinued the use of um, the small spacesuit, which obviously affects women a lot more than men. And so female astronauts often have to wear uh, spacesuits that are like too big for them, which is difficult when they have to do tasks that require a significant amount of manual dexterity, right? So they get judged really harshly in training as less competent. And then they get on like spacewalks and, and it becomes a whole thing. So between uh, 1998 and 2019, there have been 104 astronauts who have been on spacewalks and only 12 of them have been women. And so that's even more important kind of down the line as you think about when they're picking like the next commander for the next mission and they want them to be well-rounded and experienced in all of the skills. And they go, oh, we just don't have women who have done that. Um, and this happens across all industries just like this. So when we're selecting CEOs, there are disparities, but also we have to look all the way down the line to like who got the internship and who got the special project and all of that. Um, because at the end, when they say, hey, we just didn't have women with those qualifications, it's like, okay, yeah, but did you literally design it to be that way? Um, point number two, have you used Wikipedia? I'm assuming yes, um, because everybody uses Wikipedia. It's an excellent resource. One issue, 90% of the people who contribute to Wikipedia are men. Um, and probably related to that, uh, about 20% of the biographies on Wikipedia are of women, and they tend to be significantly shorter than the ones about men. Related in a different field, this is the numbers for Rotten Tomatoes in 2017, the movie critic site. About 22% of the movies or the reviews written were by women, only 4% by women from underrepresented groups. And so these are the people who decide what movies are good, which means people go to see those movies more, which means people who made them get to make more movies. And it's just kind of a self-fulfilling cycle. And so maybe all of our tastes align really well with like a 68 year old man, white man from Brooklyn, but like maybe not. Um, and yeah, Rotten Tomatoes, after they got called out for it, added 600 new critics to like diversify. But the important thing is that these are the people who decide what stories that we see, the same as the Wikipedia people. And on the topic of stories, uh, this is a, this is, um, a study done of male to female lines in animated films. And you can see by all of the blue, how much men speak in those. And some of these are princess movies. It's like Beauty and the Beast and The Little Mermaid are about 70% male lines. But the one that blows my mind the most is Frozen, a movie about two sisters that is over 50% male lines. And like this is the stuff that we grow up on. And then when we grow up, we watch these. This is 2000 films broken down male to female lines. And so what happens is when we go into classrooms and we go into offices, men end up talking more. And when men and women talk the same amount, the perception is that women talked more. And so it's, is it like, okay, do women actually talk a lot? Or are we just trained to believe that women shouldn't really be talking much at all? So given kind of the hijacking of our stories and in honor of Women's History Month, I wanted to just go through some women whose stories we probably should have learned and likely never did. Gonna go rapid fire. Okay, Ida B. Wells. Ida was born a slave, freed, was an investigative journalist in kind of post-reconstruction Memphis. And at the time, a lot of black people were being lynched, right? And including some of Ida's friends. And so the white people were trying to say that the lynchings were happening because black people were committing a lot of crimes. And Ida was like, okay, but is it really that? Or is it that now there are black people are running their own businesses and they're no longer, um, you're no longer like benefiting off of their labor, right? Because spoiler alert, this is a pattern in history. When black people see economic success, then white people tend to want to burn it down. So Ida did the work. She turned to data science. She ended up writing a hundred page pamphlet called the Red Record with 14 pages of stats in it, proving that lynchings were economically motivated. And so what did they do? They burned her newspaper down. So Ida goes to Chicago, continues working on uh, civil rights and women's rights and becomes kind of a nationally known name. Working around the same time was Jane Addams. Jane's in progressive era Chicago, which is like the happening place. Uh, in the early 1900s. And Jane is at the center of everything. She basically invented social work. 
Um, she started a settlement house, which invited young people and immigrants to, to come live there. They held classes in kindergarten. Um, and, she's, and she's also active well beyond Chicago. She helped start the NAACP and the ACLU and the International um, Women's League for Peace and Freedom, which is calling for peace at the end of the World War I. And she's the most famous woman of her day, and we've probably never heard of her now, but she had the ear of presidents from Roosevelt to Woodrow Wilson. And at one point, J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI, calls her the most dangerous woman in America because she really wants peace. And apparently that's a scary thing. Um, so she ends up winning, becoming the first American woman to win the Nobel Peace Prize. Okay, you may or may not know the name Mary Shelley, but you definitely know her work. Uh, she wrote Frankenstein when she was 20 years old. And it's, the, it's considered the first work of its genre. And Mary Shelley is considered the mother of science fiction. So if you ever hear a guy say that girls don't like sci-fi, you can tell him that actually we invented it. Um, Ada Lovelace is a poet slash mathematician, which is rad. And she's considered the first computer programmer. As you can see by this portrait, she lived before cameras were even invented. This is the 1840s. She's working with Charles Babbage. And, he, and they have this thing called the analytical engine, which is like pre, pre computer calculator thing. And so she ends up translating this paper about that work from Italian. The paper is about 15 pages long. She adds 41 pages of her own notes. And included in that is what's, what is really the first written computer program. And not only that, but she, she talks about how these processes can be used later to, for, for music and images. She's basically in the, in the 1840s, like predicting Spotify and Instagram. It's ridiculous. Okay, Bessie Coleman is uh, also known as Brave Bessie, the first African-American and the first Native American woman pilot. Nobody would teach her how to fly in the US, so she had to go over to France, got her pilot's license, came back, became a stunt pilot, flew all kinds of crazy stuff in air shows across the US, and ended up inspiring generations of women after her to fly. Madam C.J. Walker, she experienced hair loss um, and ended up developing her own line of products uh, specifically designed for the health of black women's hair. She creates an entire empire around this, becomes the first black woman millionaire and the first woman of any race to become a self-made millionaire. And not only that, but she creates thousands of jobs and employs mostly black women. And there's a um, limited series on Netflix right now called Self Made, starring Octavia Spencer, that you should watch. It's great. Dolores Huerta is one of the founder, one of the founders of the National Farm Workers Association, and has been working on um, the rights and economic opportunities for migrant farm workers since like the 50s and 60s. Uh, and she's also worked a lot in the women's rights movement, pushing intersectionality, and then the women's rights is not just a white women's movement. Uh, she's the first Latina inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame and has a Presidential Medal of Freedom. And if you've ever heard the chant, Si Se Puede, that was Dolores. Okay, Margaret Hamilton. So you know how we landed on the moon, right? The whole like one small step for man thing. So what they won't tell you, the story that we we're never going to hear is that man landed on the moon that day thanks to Margaret. So Margaret was a software engineer. She actually coined the term software engineer. And she wrote the code for all the Apollo missions. That picture is Margaret standing next to her code. And so Margaret decided that they needed a system within the space shuttle to identify what happens when there's an error, to identify what, what the actual error was and communicate that to, to the astronauts. And so minutes before we landed on the moon, alarms start going off. And you'll see this in any movie about the moon landing. Minutes before we land. And so they have to decide, right, whether or not they're going to abort, if they're going to like kill their astronauts by landing. And because of Margaret's system, they were able to see what the problem was, see that a switch was just out of place and make the call to, to go. And that's why we were allowed to land on the moon that day. About 15 years after man landed on the moon, they finally put an American woman in space and that was Sally Ride. Um, and nine years after her in 1992, Mae Jemison became the first black woman in space. And you know whose picture Mae Jemison carried with her when she went into the space shuttle? Bessie Coleman. So I was gonna end with astronauts too, because what's cooler than astronauts? But then I was remembered um, Sister Rosetta Tharp. So Sister Rosetta was a singer, songwriter, and guitarist. She was like the first big gospel uh, recording artist in the 30s and 40s. And she has been called the original soul sister and the godmother of rock and roll. There was a quote in an NPR article about her and it said something like, rock and roll was bred between the church and the nightclubs 
in the soul of a queer black woman in the 1940s. And when they ask Little Richard and Elvis and Chuck Berry and Tina Turner and Aretha and Johnny Cash, who they listened to and who influenced them, they all said Sister Rosetta. And so they, and she's a really prolific guitarist. And so they used to compliment her by saying she played like a man. And this is my favorite quote. She would turn to them and she'd say, can't no man play like me. And so women are still making history. These are some of them who made history over the last few years and we're still working for, for rights and, and coming up with vaccines and all kinds of different things. Um, but the moral of the story is that women have always been there and women of color have always been there and we can't let them erase our stories. So we just have to keep telling them.